Sarah Timmer Harvey spoke about uh, translation of the novel What I Would Rather Not Think About which is shortlisted for International Booker Prize 2024 in this episode. Sarah is a translator and writer currently based in Woodstock, New York. She holds an MFA from Columbia University in New York and a BA from Southern Cross University. Sarah's translation of Yanta Posthumus novel What I Would Rather Not Think About was published by Scribe in 2023. Reconstruction the translation of stories written by the Dutch Surinamese writer Karin Emmat Mukrim was published by Strangers Press in 2020 as part of their Verzet series and their translation of Tizil by Nadia De Vries will be published by New Menard Press in 2024 Sarah's translation of Dutch language poetry and prose have appeared in Modern Poetry in Translation Asymptote Gulf Coast Journal The Los Angeles Review and elsewhere. Born in Australia, Sarah lived and worked in the Netherlands for 14 years before moving to New York City in 2013. You can buy the novel What I Would Rather Not Think About using the link given in the show notes. You may please give us your feedback on this episode using the Spotify app. So Sarah, welcome to Harshaniyam. Lovely to have you with us today. Thank you. Lovely to be here. Now, you were born in Australia and uh, graduated from the United States from Columbia University. That's correct. What drew you to Dutch literature? Well, uh, I lived in the Netherlands for 14 years and I consider it as much my home as Australia where I was born and raised. for such a small country the netherlands is really bursting with a lot of literary talent and kind of equally passionate readers so it's hard not to be attracted to dutch literature a lot of dutch writing tends to be quite experimental and boundary pushing which i really enjoy as a reader even before i became a translator uh when i was reading dutch books i often found myself translating the novels and poetry in my head so you learned dutch after moving to netherlands or yeah i learned uh when i moved there i was supposed to move for one year and uh, well i ended up staying <laughs> for 14 years you worked there for some time you worked there for uh, 14 years i did i actually have never had an adult job in australia i've only my professional history has only happened in the netherlands and um i immigrated to to the netherlands when i was quite young and uh so i've never actually had a had a a grown up job in australia I'm more uh in the netherlands and now in america where i still live you are a writer too you published books now as an artist you were a creative urge to express you can do that in writing so why translate That's a it's a really interesting question. Um I am a writer and I still write. I'm actually very slowly working on a novel between translations. But I find translation equally is fulfilling if not uh more so fulfilling than writing. I tend to get really excited about my translations in a way that I don't about my own writing and um I've been thinking about this recently wondering what it is but I think it's the collaborative aspect of it because even if I'm not directly working with the original author I'm engaging with a text that's not mine and creating something from it um using someone's uh, art and and I think that that's just so exciting that might change again i i i'm not going to box myself in uh or limit myself i may uh prioritize writing again at some point in the future i really do think that the key to creative fulfillment is to do what excites you and scares you and when it gets too comfortable you change it up and i believe it will have a beneficial impact on your writing too when you're translating Oh, absolutely. It completely does. Although I do have to be careful when I'm really immersed in a novel, 
um, or some amazing poetry. I do find myself sometimes taking on the style of uh, the novel or, or poetry that I'm working on. Um, but yes, absolutely. It's, it's always inspiring, like reading any writing is. When it comes to translating it into English, uh, I gather that uh, the English, of course, uh, the way the idioms are used, idiomatic usage, the way certain phrases, uh, you construct certain phrases, it differs from Australian English to English that is used in the United States and of course uh, British English is a bit different, right? When you are translating, uh, what is that you do? Because Netherlands doesn't belong to any of these. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, uh, before I start any translation, I always ask the publisher uh, and the writer, if I'm able, what English are we aiming for? What is the logical English to be translating into? Um, because there are so many Englishes um, and I'm lucky to have, you know, lived in Australia. I was educated, you know, in British English and I now live in America, so I'm able to draw on all of those things. But even outside of the countries that I've sort of uh, directly experienced, uh, I like to research all the various Englishes around the world. Um, I think it's really important as a translator um, to kind of understand how each generation and each region are using English and expanding it. Um, yeah, I, I, I also always search for a model uh, for the narrative voice. And sometimes that comes from uh, novels uh, that have been recently published in English or around the same time period as the English I'm trying to translate into. But it can just as easily come from film, or television, social media, and even my friends and family around the world. Uh, you use any tools or any particular dictionaries for these things? Or, Of course, you're exposed to this, but you also need some help, right? Sometimes I, I do get a little confused, and I, especially with slang, and I'm thinking, well, I have heard someone use that in this country, but is that typical? So I do always cross-reference and see how is it being used it's sort of in the local vernacular before I throw it into a translation. Uh, does uh, editing play any part in this when it gets published in different countries? Because one of the translators told me, when it gets published in Britain, the editor comes into picture sometimes. I think it depends on the book and the publisher. For this particular uh, book, there weren't really many changes apart from the cover. Uh, the cover is different in each of those regions, but it can involve editing to suit a particular market. It just depends on what the publisher wants, really. One of the other ones, uh, other book that you translated is uh, titled as Reconstruction, right? It's a collection of stories by, interestingly, a Dutch Surinamese writer, Karin Namat Mukrim. Uh, can you please tell us a bit about the book and the writer? Yes, uh, Karin Namat Mukrim is actually such an incredible writer and I'm always wondering why more of her work isn't uh, translated because she is an award-winning Dutch writer. Um, I could be wrong about this. I don't have the information in front of me, but I think that she's published f five novels. Um, and I love her writing because it really shifts between Suriname and it uh, and the Netherlands and it is very singular writing. I, I don't think I've ever read anything like it. I think that she has a very unique view of the Netherlands and um, the short stories that uh, I translated um, really do travel between both regions and some of them are magic realism, some of them are stories about various generations living in Suriname. Uh, I love them. I really enjoyed translating that and it was 
uh, part of a series that was published by Strangers Press in the UK called Verzet. And um, there's a whole set of books by various Dutch writers translated by um, some really talented translators. I would encourage everybody to read them. Now, this particular book, which is uh, long listed for uh, International Booker, what I would rather not think about, um, how did you come across uh, this book, Sarah? Uh, that's a lovely story, actually. Um, I, I've, I've been a big fan of Yenta's work for a long time. I adored her debut novel, uh, People With No Charisma. And right at the start of my translating career, I even approached her former publisher about perhaps translating it. I hadn't published very much at the time, and I don't think they were particularly impressed <laughs> um, and, uh, with me. And uh, Yenta was also in the process, I didn't know this, but Yenta was also in the process of parting ways with that particular publisher. So it, it didn't work out at the time, but I sort of put it aside and continued on with other projects. And then we cut to 2020, so the pandemic year. And one of my dear friends in the Netherlands sent me a pandemic care package. And part of the care package was this book with a note from my dear friend saying, I haven't been able to put this book down. You have to read it. Uh, so, of course, it being the pandemic, I didn't have much else to do. I immediately read it and <laughs> fell very much in love as I had with the debut novel. Um, and I reached out to her publisher. Uh, she since switched to another publisher, Plaum, who published uh, a lot of my favorite Dutch writers. And uh, they were luckily just as keen to have me translate it as I was to translate. So uh, it all worked out this time. <laughs> so what is this, uh, the, the particular aspect of the book which you really liked about? I think the way that Yenta looks and explores human relationships is really fascinating. Um, I think that her, her ability to handle such a tragic subject with humor and compassion, it just really speaks to me. Now, this book is published by Scribe Books in USA and UK. Uh, can you tell us a bit about uh, this publisher, this independent publisher, Scribe Books? Oh, yes. I'm very happy to. I love Scribe. Um, they are an independent publisher um, that was set up by a man called Hen Henry Rosenblum in the 1970s in Melbourne, Australia, my favorite city. And they've got offices in Melbourne and London and the U.S., and they publish around 65 titles per year, um, fiction and non-fiction. Um, and they're very uh, committed to translated fiction. Um, they publish a lot of really good translated fiction. Um, in fact, one of the other books on the International Book Along List, Marta 210, is also a scribe title. Um, so yes, I was really pleased when they um, picked up what I'd rather not think about and uh, particularly excited to work with an Australian publisher. Uh, I worked primarily with uh, Marika Webb Pullman, who is the publisher in the Melbourne office, and I would say one of the best and most thoughtful editors in the business. This, uh, please tell us about the author, Riante Postuma. Oh, yes. Okay. Yenta is uh, an incredible writer and also one of the funniest people I know. <laughs> she worked as a journalist for uh, many years uh, but and also published quite a bit of short fiction in uh, some very well-known uh, Dutch journals and magazines. Uh, before she published her debut novel, People With No Charisma, in 2016. Uh, People With No Charisma was 
uh, nominated for several uh, awards in the Netherlands and very well received. Um, she published her second novel, What I'd Rather Not Think About, in 2020, and that was shortlisted for the European Union Prize for Literature. Uh, it's been translated into multiple languages, Spanish, Bulgarian, German, and English, of course. Uh, and it was uh, also long-listed for the International Booker Prize this year. Uh, she has recently also published a Dutch language book called Hex, 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 which is a an exploration of witches and the representation of women in Dutch folklore. You are translating it too? I, I I would love to, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that one is... It's It's very focused on Dutch folklore, but I find it fascinating. This uh, novel is about uh, fraternal twins and uh, one of them is grieving. Uh, please introduce the novel, its theme and its characters. Yes, uh, what I'd rather not think about is about two twins indeed. Uh, they are called one and two. We never learn their names uh, in the novel. But the two of them grow up in each other's pockets uh, but they slowly start drifting apart the closer they get to adulthood and uh, in adulthood they become quite estranged with rather tragic consequences. I think that this novel examines the kind of unimaginable grief that comes from losing a sibling or a close family member but I think it's also a really good exploration of human relationships and how so many of us fail to listen to other people when they tell them and show them exactly who they are and how they feel. I think Maya Angelou said, when someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. And it sounds straightforward, but I think it's something a lot of people fail to do because they're so attached to their idea of someone and can only look at them through that one particular lens. I think that what I'd rather not think about really brilliantly explores this phenomenon and how it affects intimate relationships, but also our view of public figures and how blind we can be to the true natures of certain powerful and famous people, um, even as they have shown us and told us exactly who they are. See, this uh, particular uh, novel, mm, it's a very difficult theme that she handles, right? A suicide of a fraternal twin and uh, handling grief for most part of the world. But she handled it very well and the book was very successful, of course. What do you attribute uh, the success to? That's a really good question. Uh, I think I think it's Yenta's, oh, as I mentioned earlier, Yenta's unique ability to look at something and infuse it with humor because that is real life. I think when we're grieving, it's not one note. We have good moments. We have bad moments. We look back and we can laugh at memories. Um, we can recognize our blind spots. And I think that Yenta does that so brilliantly in some in such understated language that it really speaks to people. It feels real. Can you tell us uh, about any interesting or challenging experience uh, as far as uh, translating the book is concerned? Or any interaction while you are translating you had with other? Any interesting anecdotal experience, sir? Yeah, okay. Uh, I think early on in the translation of this novel, before we had a publisher, um, there was a certain European literary arts funding institution um, that offered their support, but they also asked me if they could assess my translation first. I was actually really pleased because their support at the time could have really made all the difference in terms of 
which publishers would look at the sample and be interested in um, publishing what I'd rather not think about. And this was a real passion project for me, so I was really invested. In any case, I always think it's really good to get as many eyes on a translation as possible. I welcome criticism and I think that it can only improve a text. But the feedback that I got from this particular institution was really brutal. Um, they questioned in, in actually quite a rude and patronizing way some of the translated details about New York, uh, my language and word choice, and they even questioned my ability to translate Dutch humor at all. Um, yes, um, they said I might be better suited to translating serious nonfiction books. <laughs> Uh, I was really shocked because I'd already shown the draft to several people in the New York publishing industry and they had found it very funny and hadn't raised any of the issues that the uh, this assessor from the institution had flagged. Nevertheless, I was really crushed um, and that assessment really made me question my instincts as a translator and wonder if I was indeed up to the task if I was going to do Yenta's brilliant writing justice. So I, I asked for a meeting with the institution and I really quickly realized that the people who had assessed my work didn't necessarily have any real knowledge about New York while I was living there. Um, they weren't at all up to date with the kind of sort of humorous Gen X millennial voices that were being published in the UK and the US at the time. And some of their language and style notes just felt really outdated for the kind of narrated voice that Yenta had written. Um, but even after the meeting, I still thought, well, this is a well-known institution, I should adjust my translation. So I did, I, I did adjust it, but it felt really off. It didn't read as well. And I had another editor friend, an American editor friend, look at it and, and yeah, the feedback was, it's not as funny. So after a lot of debate, I ended up reverting to my original and sending out my original, much longer sample to publishers. How much time uh, it took for you additionally? Oh, I think around six months uh, in total. But, but, you know, there was back and forth. And I also like to put translations down and away. I always try to build in time to put something away and come back at it with fresh eyes. It's really important for my practice. But, um, uh, but between the bad assessment and me deciding to send out my own uh, version, only a few months. Um, but anyway, I sent it out and, well, Scribe and other publishing houses were interested. Scribe wasn't the only one who wanted to publish it. We went with Scribe in the end. But Scribe said one of the primary reasons they picked it up was for the humor, you know. Um, and I think I really learned an important lesson from that experience, and that was to trust my gut. I think that input and feedback is really important for any manuscript or translation. But I think that even seasoned professionals and institutions can have their blind spots. And, I, you know, I think the way the industry is set up uh, now, these kinds of institutions and funding bodies do really essential work uh, in supporting writers and translators, but they aren't infallible. And I really wish that someone at the time had told me it was okay to push back if I felt something wasn't right. You know, I think that honing your own compass for what works and doesn't work in writing and translation is just as important as the language itself. Um, and I think it's also really important to find readers that you can trust 
who can criticize your work in a way that is thoughtful and informed and aimed at helping you improve it. Working with Yenta on this book has been one of the most rewarding experiences I've had as a translator. Uh, I've gotten to know her as a person and deeply understand her writing. And I think building that kind of relationship with a writer as a translator is so wonderful and rewarding. And I'm excited that we're going to be uh, working together again. We're going to be, uh, I'm translating currently for Scribe again, uh, her first novel, People with No Charisma. Now, before we end it, uh, in the conversation, please read an excerpt from the novel, which you really liked. Any, any part. And uh, I also just wanted to give a little trigger warning for this, because there is mention of suicide in the text. So if any listeners are uncomfortable, I'd suggest they now switch off. <laughs> I used to sleep with a Continental Airlines poster above my bed. It was an image of the Twin Towers set against the pink evening light. Compared to the towers, the Statue of Liberty appeared minuscule in the foreground. Liberty looked like she was trying to set the towers on fire with her torch. I bought the poster at a flea market I went to every Saturday with my father. When I came home with it, my brother said, that photo is inaccurate. In reality, the towers aren't the same height. I dreamed of seeing the towers up close. I didn't need to go inside them and certainly didn't want to go to the top, although standing underneath the towers could also be risky. Ever since a famous pop star had jumped out of a hotel window in the city closest to our own, and we learned from our mother that the self-inflicted death of a celebrity was usually followed by a wave of copycat suicides, we would look up to the top of every tall building we passed to see if there were any jumpers. Our parents were geologists, so they looked at the ground a lot. They both worked at the Geological Institute in the city. My mother was an expert in landslides, and my father did microscopic soil research. Whenever there was any dirt that needed excavating, my brother and I had to list the various layers of soil we observed. During our vacations in Sweden, we were constantly hacking away at the ground, searching for fossils that were at least 350 million years old. My parents didn't think anything younger than that was worth the trouble. I collected minerals and fossils, not because I thought they were beautiful, but because my mother also collected them. She displayed the most interesting specimens in every available corner of the house. The rest were stored in boxes underneath her bed, where my collection also ended up once I grew tired of it. My brother collected comic books and my father collected old biscuit tins. One of the walls in the shed was covered entirely with tins that held all my father's screws and nails. He didn't organize the tins by their contents, but rather by color, just like the layers of soil on the geological chart on the opposite wall. Every layer was a different earth tone. I enjoyed being in the shed, looking at the colors and at my father's back as he opened tin after tin, searching for the right nail. My father also liked hanging out in the shed, presumably for the colours, because he wasn't much of a handyman, though he acted like he was, in the same way he pretended to be a fun dad. So nice, wonderful, wonderful to listen in your voice. Thank you, Thank you for your uh, time and patience and uh, wish you the very best uh, for the competition. Thank you so much for having me, I've really enjoyed speaking with you.